Hello, uh, my name is Chris Nevin and I work for NCC Group. So this tool is called Carnivore. Uh, so that's a Microsoft external attack tool uh, or assessment tool. So the cryptozoologists amongst you might know this, so that spells meat. So that's very amusing. Uh, and it's basically a tool to help pen testers find misconfigurations and vulnerabilities in Microsoft on-premises uh, servers. So also apologies if I talk quickly, but there is uh, uh, quite a lot to get through. So uh, the basic outline of the presentation. So I'm going to start with a demonstration just to show what the tool can do and then dive a bit deeper into some of the techniques um, and the research behind them uh, after that. So now intro demonstration. OK, so first a quick overview just to give you a taste um, of what the tool can do. So just before I kick it off, we've selected all services um, and we're also going to attempt to discover the internal domain information. Um, you might notice that it's a .nev domain. Um, obviously that wouldn't normally be a top level domain, but this is my training lab. Um, so first of all, it's going to look for DNS, um, sorry, do DNS lookups for subdomains which are normally connected with a particular service. So for example, link discover with Skype. Um, then it verifies there's something there. So it's not just a wildcard uh, resolution. And then it also does some checks to make sure, is, does it also actually seem to be a, an Exchange or a Skype server? Um, so I've also built in uh, some uh, kind of bailout options. So for example, if we get back a server header saying that it's Nginx, uh, it's not even Windows, we don't need to test every possible endpoint just in case one of them is a Skype server. Um, so yes, so that's something that we do. Um, so it also validates the username enumeration and the password spray URL separately. Um, I'll come on to that in a, in a little bit, uh, but basically there are um, occasions where uh, an organization might have hidden most things, but there'll be one password spray URL kind of hidden away. So um, we try the most obvious, and then if they don't hit, there are other kind of password spray uh, endpoints that are possible. So yeah, so hopefully if an organization has something exposed, then we'll be able to find it uh, to report to them. Um, so we also uh, log everything here, um, and you've got export options. Uh, if you want to kind of manually uh, export things for some reason. Um, I'll cover Office 365 more at the end, um, but for this section, if Office 365 is ticked, then it will explicitly check if uh, this has any kind of cloud presence. Um, even if it's not ticked, then the response to Skype for Business, for example, might come back and say, I'm hosted in the cloud, and then we'll still do the standard kind of checks for is it federated um, and that kind of thing. And then it will add, um, so say we just did Skype for Business, it says it's in the cloud, it turns out it's federated, we'll get an Office 365 and an ADFS um, option here. Um, so, okay, so we've also got global verb verbosity here. So you can kind of uh, tweak that up and down uh, depending on what you wanna see. Um, okay, so let me kick this off. Okay, so the other thing with this um, discover internal domain, then it does the fairly standard blank type one NTLM message. Um, and you can see it's pulled back the internal domain name. So at the moment it does that individually for each of these services. Um, and that's because, you know, Skype might be hosted in Germany and ADFS server, the ADFS server might be in Canada for some reason. Um, and so when you're hitting, when you're spraying that server, then you've got the internal domain inf information for the particular server that you're hitting. Um, and in fact, even on a job just last week, then these were all different. Um, so it does happen quite frequently. Uh, I might add some kind of advanced options. Um, so you can say, just assume they're all the same. Um, but like I say, that's maybe, uh, you know, a recipe for potential disaster. So, okay, we've also got the IP addresses here. So you can obviously check those against your scope. And if you want to, you can kind of run this once, check the IP addresses against your scope, and then do the more active kind of blank NTLM1 message. Um, so for the other thing to mention is for Skype. So Link Discover is the kind of auto discover service. 
and that actually points to the real server, which is what we want to hit. So that's why there's two um, kind of uh, entries for Skype there. So we've now got Skype, Exchange, ADFS and RD Web. So I'm going to show you a quick run through of uh, username enumeration and password spraying just to give you a, an idea. So smart enumeration, we'll leave it on the defaults. Um, we're also going for password one, just kind of standard. So you see there's quite a lot of usernames to try here um, as it's going through. We found one of a particular format. So it's now continuing to loop through nine different formats. Um, and you'll see that when we discover the correct format, then this will um, drop drastically because then we switch to just using usernames of that format. So we've now got two of the same format. So first initial surname. And now we've got three. So you'll see that it's now selected that format of J Smith. Um, so everything we do, uh, oh, sorry. If we left that continuing, it would just be as you can see here, it's now less usernames and it's just doing uh, usernames of that format. So now I'll quickly show you a password spray as well. Um, so I'll use that same format, J Smith. Um, so for the password spray, that will now spray that in the kind of modern uh, style username format. So J Smith at nevtech.nev. Um, and we'll just try summer 2020. Uh, just to see if there happens to be a user who might have been daft enough to use that as a password. Uh, so here we go. So that's going to take a second. Um, I'm sure we're not going to find anyone because, of course, no one ever uses passwords like this. Uh, who would possibly be that foolish? So here we go. We give it another couple of seconds. You can see again, this is just doing that one username list. So obviously that's the same number of users total that it will be spraying as um, the smart enumeration was looking at. So it should be around about now. So there you go. So we've now uncovered one user with that password. Um, we've used the RD web service, but obviously um, we could have sprayed that on any of these other services and uh, at the moment, looking at the internal domain information, we can probably assume that um, they're kind of going to be the same across all of them. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. Let's just do one uh, with Skype. So who should we go for? Uh, oops, so actually, sorry, we've got Jay Smith. So let's do Skype. So just to show you, you can also password spray enumerated users um, so let's use that same thing. Okay, it was 2019. <laughs> okay, so for that option, then we were spraying the users in the in the legacy format because those are the ones we've already enumerated. Um, and for username enumeration, that's incredibly slow because for every invalid user, you might have to wait something like 20 or 30 seconds. Um, when we're spraying this list of already enumerated users, then we kind of know already um, that they exist. And, and actually that's still quite fast, even when spraying in legacy format, because you're not having to wait for every invalid user. Um, so obviously we've now um, got him as well. You can see we've got this access token here. So I'll quickly show you the address book. Um, so we'll choose this user who we've already got the access token for. Um, again, I'll explain in more detail some of these other settings, uh, but for now, we're just gonna let this go, see what happens. Uh, I'm also gonna come back to the meeting snooper later. So this is just to kind of show uh, the address book functionality. Here we go. And so you can see now uh, all of these other users popping up. So we get the SIP username, uh, the email address, title, department. Um, we can kind of tick these on and off. The default settings that I've got here are basically the ones we can get relatively quickly. Um, so if I actually expand that and choose to pull some of this other information, it can take quite a long time, especially with quite a large domain. Um, so in this instance, we just go for the default. It's fairly quick. Um, 
obviously for my test lab, this is quite a small uh, number of users, but there you go. You can see the general gist of what's possible with this tool. Okay, so now for some uh, just general statistics. Uh, so first of all, uh, I basically ran a version of this against uh, the Alexa, well, the top 100,000 of the Alexa top a million. Um, of those, 11.79% uh, were attackable at all. And so this shows that of that 11, about 11%, uh, so how many had each service? So obviously some uh, could have had more than one service. Um, this started, uh, Carnivore started initially as a, a Skype attacking uh, assessment tool. So that's secretly my favorite, but you can see it's kind of still getting beaten out by Exchange and ADFS. Um, maybe not by all that much. So one caveat with the uh, kind of cloud element here is that there, there are some false positives in there um, because for this assessment, I didn't explicitly check which um, whether they were hosted in Office 365. So this is just listing um, if when I made a link discover request, did it come back and say it was hosted in the cloud? Um, so actually that number might even be higher if we'd have explicitly asked. Um, and for some of them, it kind of seems to suggest that they're uh, hosted in the cloud, but then maybe everything isn't properly configured and, and that service isn't there. It's like I say, the cloud kind of um, maybe take with a pinch of salt, but the others, um, that's what was found and what was kind of verified as existing. So the first part, subdomain enumeration, uh, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so as I said before, um, I split the username enumeration uh, URL and, and the pass spray or the endpoint validation. Um, previously, it bailed if the username enumeration wasn't there, but then I found multiple times, um, and in fact, on that wider kind of mass uh, uh, assessment I did, then quite often you would find uh, an organization to have just one or just the other. Um, so, for example, here you can see actually there's 53% uh, had a password spray endpoint over 47% uh, with a username enumeration. So kind of 6% more had um, a password spray endpoint than had both. There were some that just had username enumeration. And um, what's interesting about this is that it means that for those organizations with just a, a kind of weird password spray NTLM authentication endpoint somewhere, then it seems likely that they potentially might not even be aware of that because they've kind of firewalled off or hidden away all of the well-known, uh, the username enumeration, the standard login points. Um, but then, you know, they have this one password spray endpoint that um, kind of seems to have eluded that. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. So Carnivore looks for subdomains uh, in the order shown here. So th these statistics are taken from that 11% um, of the 100,000. Um, so hopefully it means that we'll do as few requests as possible um, because obviously we're looking at the one that's highly likely to exist um, and then only looking at the others if it doesn't. Um, so in future, I might add an option for a kind of you know, you can choose between light or full enumeration. So maybe you could choose to just look at the top two and then discount it. Um, and yeah, so then again, maybe managing to kind of cut that down even more as to how many requests you need to send. So now uh, username enumeration in, in a little bit more detail. So we're gonna start with a demonstration. Okay, so we've got uh, various options here that I'm gonna go through. So firstly, smart enumeration that we saw before. So basically that will take um, these nine different uh, formats of username um, taken from the top statistically likely uh, usernames lists. Um, and it, would, it will basically try the top username in each list and then the top of the next list, top of the next list. Um, and essentially, as you saw before, it's looking for three valid usernames of the same format. Um, so that's using the timing based difference, um, which is fairly well known for Skype and Exchange. Um, I've added it uh, here for ADFS and RD Web as well. Um, so we've got this advanced option here as well that if you want, um, you can kind of pick a format and where you want to start in that list. Um, or you can leave it as it is. You can also do an individual username or you can provide your own list. 
um, or there's these pre-built ones. So these are kind of standard and service accounts. Um, and Council Killer was created by my colleague uh, Owen Bellis. Um, so that's kind of a list of maybe fairly standard um, user accounts that might be in there. So you can set the password. So obviously also uh, it works on the timing base difference. And then also if you get the password right, then great. Um, so again, I would just show you, uh, obviously this is fairly similar to what we saw before. Um, one interesting additional uh, point to note is uh, additional information you can get depending on the service. So for Skype, then we can actually determine quite a bit of additional information. So SIP enabled basically just means, um, so actually, sorry, some of these will only come up if you get the password right as well. So SIP enabled would mean you've got the username and the password right and that user is basically um, set up on Skype. So account disabled, whatever password you give, um, you would get that if the account is disabled. Um, you should see that in a second. Uh, now that it's switched over. In fact, I might have re-enabled that user. But so basically, if you get a disabled account, then essentially we won't do anything else with it because uh, basically whatever you put in, you're not going to be able to kind of do anything. Um, for Skype, you can also tell if the password's expired and it's possible that you might actually then be able to take that password. And if you found an endpoint, um, you know, maybe for the VPN, it might be you can even kind of put that password in and it will ask you to reset it. Um, obviously on a test, that's probably a little bit too um, crazy of a thing to do, uh, maybe for a red team or with the kind of technical point of contacts, uh, you know, green light. Um, and then for Skype, we can also get this server error, but again, that means you've got the password right. Um, and as I said before, you'll get the access token there if you do. Um, so yeah, username enumeration. Okay, so as you've just seen, smart enumeration uh, will take nine lists of statistically likely usernames, um, and it will go through those until it finds three of the same, and then automatically select that format, uh, and then carry on. Now, one interesting thing is this difference between legacy and modern formats. So legacy is domain slash username. Uh, modern kind of email style is username at domain. Um, so that can match, that they can match, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, and again, the modern format could match the email, but doesn't necessarily have to. Um, now for username enumeration, we can only use the legacy format, um, and that's to get that timing based difference. Um, so one interesting thing is that that causes a little hiccup when rolling over to password spraying. So previously I used username enumeration to discover the format and then just assumed that it would be the same for the modern format for when we spray. Um, now, because technically that might not be the case, uh, I don't do that anymore. The problem is it means that on password spraying, if you choose to use the discovered username format, then invalid usernames will still take uh, ages to do. So what I would suggest as a, as a way of doing this, um, because basically, yes, so username enumeration, every invalid user, 30 to 40 seconds. So if you waited for that to finish anyway, that's going to take the rest of the day, a couple of days. So ideally, what you want to do anyway is use username enumeration to get the the potential or the likely format um, that might take five five minutes say then pause that switch over to password spray um, and then instead of uh, using the discovered format um, which because we've only discovered that in the legacy style uh, then that will take a long time so instead pick the same format and password spray those Hopefully you should get some credentials or some invalid, uh, sorry, disabled accounts, which give you a pointer that that is the correct format. Um, but if you don't, then it is possible that the formats don't match um, and you might need to do a little bit more kind of manual going through different potential uh, formats to discover which it is. Um, so the other thing to say is that, uh, so obviously with username enumeration, we discover a valid username even if the password is wrong. Um, whereas for password spraying, we only find out anything if we get both correct. Um, so 
you can, if you want to, stay with the username enumeration. You get a nice list and it takes 48 hours. However, because you will essentially be hitting the same users with the password that you're trying, then actually, in terms of progressing the test, then you're not going to really lose anything by switching over to password spraying. You're going to be hitting the same users. So you're going to find the same users that might have password one as their password. Um, just it will take 10 minutes instead of two days. Um, so yeah, so that would be my suggested method. So now I'm going to show um, where we get the time based difference and some other things for ADFS and RD web, because I don't think there's much publicly written about those. Um, whereas there is for uh, Skype and Exchange. So th this is maybe more interesting. Um, so this is where we get the time based difference for ADFS. Um, now for ADFS, there's this extra kind of interesting extra bit, which is that it needs uh, an MSIS SAML cookie to be uh, sent in the request. So basically in order to get that, I first send a request here, um, sorry, to the same place, but with this single sign out um, parameter and basically the response to that will give us the, um, the cookie that we need which we then here um, include when we make a password um, guess as you can see um, and then here you'll see the invalid response um, so it's just 200 okay uh, and you know so that's told us nothing or with the timing difference maybe it's told us if, if the user's valid and this is a valid response. We get the 302 redirect and it sets this MSIS auth cookie. So for RD web, uh, we make a post request like this. So there's the username and the password uh, to this URL. And if it's invalid, then we get the 200 okay again. Um, and for TSWA auth HTTP only cookie, then that either isn't there or it's blank. Um, so again, we can use timing based difference uh, with the username. Or uh, if it's completely valid, so the username and password are correct, again, it's the 302 redirect and that TSWA auth HTTP only cookie uh, now has a value as shown there. Okay, so now password spraying. So as I said before, uh, there's a little hiccup here with the discovered format. Um, so obviously that's up to you um, if you want to stick with that discovered format or just simply choose it from the list um, and we'll spray that in the user app domain uh, style instead. Um, so for password spraying, it basically defaults to using that style if possible because it's quicker um, and, you know, um, also, if you provide a list of usernames, um, you can, if you want, provide it with domain slash user or user at domain, and it will use what you've given. Um, so uh, let me have a look. Yep. So also, as I said, you can use these pre-built lists um, if you want to go for that, or you can give it a file of your own. Um, and as I've said, if you want to, you can kind of pre-add uh, whatever you want in there, um, and it will use that instead. So another thing to say is that if you want to, you can just go straight to password spraying. You don't have to do the username enumeration first. Um, so yeah, basically, if you've done the subdomain enumeration, you've got the internal domain information, you can just go straight here. Maybe you've done some OSINT and you have an idea what the format might be. You can just go straight here and spray it. Okay, so now a little demonstration of password spraying. Uh, so I can show you that in a bit more detail as well. Okay, so as you can see here, the top option uh, is use discovered username format. So if we'd already done the username enumeration, then we'd be able to basically just tick that here. And as I've said, that will spray it in the legacy format. So you need to be careful. Um, the other choice you've got is that you can just pick what list you want to spray. Um, again, you can spray these kind of inbuilt lists. You can give it a file of your own um, and or you can also spray just enumerated users, um, which again will use the the username um, that we've already discovered, the format that we've already discovered that user in, because obviously we know that that exists. Um, so again, you can put the password in here. That's obviously distinct to the username enumeration password. Um, and then if I click spray, you'll see that this is much quicker um, because this is able to be multi-threaded, you're not waiting to check that the uh, kind of timing-based um, 
uh, you know, information is uh, accurate, which multi-threading the username enumeration can kind of throw that off because you're uh, making it do multiple ones at the same time. Um, and as you can see, so it's gone through the list and as we saw before, uh, it's found this user and access token here. And we've also got one with the disabled account. Okay, so as you saw there, we've got these different columns. Um, so for Office 365 spraying, I'll come on to how we do that uh, at the end. Um, but basically, if, you, if, you, if we can spray the Microsoft login portal, then we can determine a valid user uh, versus an invalid user and valid credentials versus invalid credentials. Um, and we can also actually tell if, the, if you've got the right username and password, but the organization has MFA enabled. So SIP enabled just means that they have Skype access. Um, and then depending on the service, we can tell some additional things. So again, Skype is actually my favorite uh, service to look at uh, because you can actually tell the most from, uh, from Skype. So we can tell if the account's disabled, you can tell if they're SIP enabled, um, and you can tell if the, even if the password is expired. So you've got password right, but it's expired. Um, and also this server error, we can still tell that that's a valid username and password. Um, for Exchange and RD Web, then we can also still tell um, if the password is expired uh, or if it's correct, um, but not uh, some of the additional information. So username enumeration um, is timing based, so I only have one location uh, for each of those where that's possible. Uh, but for password spraying, there's multiple places we can kind of spray. So again, from the, the 100,000 that I looked at, uh, that's where these statistics have come from. So this is the order um, in the subdomain enumeration and when we're validating if the password spray endpoints there, this is the order that Carnival will look for those in. Um, again, hopefully this will reduce how many requests we need to make. Um, and in the future, again, maybe that advanced option to say, just look at the top two. Obviously you can see here, the top two would actually get the vast majority of um, in, you know, would have found it in the vast majority of cases. And then we've got some where there's literally just one out of that 11% that, that had slash web ticket was there. Um, so this is a mix of known endpoints kind of publicly written about. Uh, one's taken from IIS from the server itself um, and which allow NTLM authentication. So um, NTLM authentication, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail now. So yeah, so just to mention briefly, uh, when I had a look, there kind of doesn't seem to be that much for NTLM, uh, web-based NTLM authentication spraying. Uh, it's possible Hydra or something similar might do it, uh, but there didn't seem to be that many tools for it. So here's a little bit of code, um, very simple for C Sharp. So we can literally just create the new network credential, give it the username and password. Um, and then in response, if it's 401 unauthorized, it's bad. Otherwise you're good to go. Um, so yeah, incredibly simple. And Carnivore is able to password spray NTLM auth endpoints. Um, so for uh, those, you can still do the, the blank type one message, um, but actually it's part of the protocol is kind of determining and including the domain name. So um, here, when we're giving the username and password, we can literally just say C Scott password one, um, and actually, as part of this request, it will add the NevTech element of that. Um, so an interesting thing to note is that, uh, as I said before, when I included a, um, some NTLM authentication endpoints um, with the list of subdomains that I look at, then there were some quite big organizations where everything else seemed to not be accessible. And then you've got one kind of weird NTLM auth endpoint hidden away meaning that they are still susceptible to password spraying against the internal domain. Um, essentially, I mean, this could even be used for denial of service because yes, the, we hit the normal password lockout policies, but essentially if you purposefully hit that and you, you know, you've locked out everyone in, in the domain. So that's obviously something that an organization would want to be aware of because um, that would be a, a bad day for them as well. So a quick sidetrack into a note on some of these different services, just in case you haven't seen them before. 
Um, so ADFS, uh, it's a portal that um, can be uh, present to allow you to sign in to different third party services. Um, sometimes these might be assumed to be internal. So on past red teams, then this has given access to full job posting applications. Um, so third party applications, but that were linked to the company's Twitter and LinkedIn, all of their job postings. So obviously um, for kind of phishing or ongoing attacks, then having access through ADFS to that company's kind of LinkedIn job postings um, or even reputational damage um, could have been fairly troubling. So basically you go to the same um, URL that I gave earlier and that would give um, or would normally give a kind of drop down list where you'll see the different applications that you can authenticate um, into. Uh, so I've also seen um, internal service desks that you can get into. Uh, it was logging all call center queries. So that contained incredibly sensitive customer details and information because it was everyone in their call center put it, putting in, you know, this customer with this bank account number and this credit card number has this question. Um, and that was basically accessible externally through ADFS. Um, and also things like HR user admin portals. Um, and so one other thing to note there is the if it's Office 365 and federated equals win. So basically um, Office 365's password spraying um, avoidance and defense mechanisms are fairly brutal. But basically if the organization is federated, it means that you not not just that you can, but that you have to hit the, the ADFS server um, and the response to a request I'll show in a bit um, will tell you where that ADFS server is. And basically, um, yeah, so if that exists, it's actually a lot better for us because it means we can avoid Office 365's robust uh, defense mechanisms and we're just hitting ADFS the same as we would uh, before. Um, and for RDP, uh, that one's fairly simple. It's literally just remote desktop through the web. Um, depending on how that's configured, maybe you'll be able to RDP into a workstation in the domain, um, you know, things like that. And yeah, so hopefully you'll have seen Skype and Outlook before. So now post compromise, uh, we're going to look at the address list pulling first with a quick demonstration. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, so this is used to pull the address book um, through the UCWA API, uh, just to, so just to remind you what that looked like. So we had these options here. So uh, if you untick both of those, that means you're just looking for the compromised user. Um, personal contacts is the personal contacts of that compromised user, so their favorites. Um, that's an interesting one for, say, ongoing social engineering, because then you know um, and from the other information you've got here, then you know, okay, my compromised user has this job, he, his favorites include these people, um, and they have these jobs. So in terms of kind of uh, fashioning a, a good phishing um, payload, then obviously that would be incredibly useful. Um, we can kind of run this on the personal contacts first and then add in the full address list um, just to make that distinction, or yes, just pick the full address list. Um, the data here, as I said before, so the ones that are chosen by default, those are the uh, ones that are quicker to get. Um, so for some reason, the way that the UCWA API works, then we get different pieces of information depending on where we've uh, queried that person. So if they're you, you get this information. If they're your personal contact, you get this information. If, if it's through the people search function, you get that information. So this is kind of the stripped down list of what you get in every case. Um, then if you want to kind of go on and pull everything back, we can, um, but that can take numerous additional requests per user. Um, so obviously for a domain of say 6,000 people, that could take an incredibly long amount of time. So what we do is if we kick this off, oh, I might have just missed the button. That's a good, good sign. Um, so you'll see it, it will pull back the um, the kind of standard information for the users first, and then it will kick off some additional threads to pull that um, additional information. And then as we go, you'll see that start to fill in. Um, 
and then I'll go over some of these things later and uh, the additional settings here I'll go over in more detail. Okay, so as you just saw, um, the information that we can get back through Skype for Business uh, is a bit of a social engineer's dream. So you've got the department, you've got the office they, location they work in, um, you've got even whether they're online or offline. Um, additionally, this does say online mobile, online desktop. Um, so I've never fully seen that work in a useful way, but um, that option's there. So we also get email address, phone number, um, and this note here is any status message that they've set. Um, so those quite frequently I've seen people will put on there about annual leave if they're gonna be out of the office. Um, so obviously again, as far as social engineering goes, you know what office they're in, you know their name, email address, um, what their job title is, you know they're gonna be out of the office. Um, so quite a lot of information for maybe even being able to turn up and say, you know, oh, I'm supposed to be meeting so-and-so or um, or even um, impersonating someone and you know that they're definitely not gonna be in the office. Um, so as I was saying, the problem is some of this extra information does take a large number of additional requests. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, by all means tick all, uh, but just beware that might take a very long time. Um, and yeah, those are the options you've got. So Carnivore pulls uh, the internal address book back using people search uh, on the UC with the UCWA API. So this does mean that we're essentially having to search letter by letter, A through Z. Um, however, there's an upper limit of 100 on the amount of responses it returns. And there isn't a next link that we can say, here's the first 100, now go to the next link for the next you know, however many and so on. Um, so basically what we have to resort to is searching by digraphs and trigraphs. So essentially A, B, A, C, A, D, and then even A, B, C, A, B, D, A, B, E. Um, and so uh, basically we, we can then um, take either the, um, from the top statistically likely usernames list, we can do all of the likely uh, and unique kind of three letters that are there, um, or you can do all possible two character combinations. So what's interesting and fun about the UCWA API is that there doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason as to um, the way that works in terms of what we get back. So to take an example, um, if we're looking for every Paul in the domain, so we know that there's four um, and we search for P, you get back 150 results. So we're just gonna get the top 100, there's two Pauls in there. So then we search for PA, uh, we get back 20 results, but this time there's three Pauls. So we've got one extra, but for some reason, even though we haven't hit the upper limit, we've still not actually got back every Paul uh, who's in the domain. So then we search for PAU, um, and now we get this mysterious rogue fourth pool that we've never seen before. Um, so essentially in the uh, interest of me keeping my sanity, I've stuck with digraphs and trigraphs. Um, it's possible you might wanna go on and do quad graphs and quint graphs and whatever else they're called. Um, however, so when I looked at this with the common trigraphs then, uh, and then with every possible three character combination, that actually only um, added an additional, I think it was maybe even one user um, in a domain of 6,000. And the difference is common does 2,249 uh, requests, whereas every possible was about 17,500. So all of that for one additional user um, that as I've said was kind of hiding away um, and we weren't able to get otherwise. So essentially, hopefully that explains the kind of options on the address list a little bit more. Uh, one additional uh, kind of side note, so it's fairly uncommon, but I've seen it where a misconfigured uh, Microsoft web app proxy basically meant that when you auth to the first server um, and it gives you back the token and then you try and use that against the application's endpoint, um, then it essentially sends it to the wrong place uh, or you've been auth to the wrong box um, and so it then doesn't like it. Um, that actually also stops the legitimate Skype client from being able to authenticate um, 
you know, uh, to, to Skype. Um, however, now Carnivore is able to detect that. Um, it re-auths to the correct box and carries on. So basically, Carnivore is able to connect and carry on using the API, uh, even when the legitimate client actually couldn't. Okay, so now the final post-compromise uh, function, which is meeting snooper. Um, so unfortunately, my lab servers stopped working for this. Uh, so we have to make do with uh, screenshots. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, this is the meeting snooper um, tab. So once you've compromised the user, if you've got Skype available, um, so this uses the UCWA API as well, um, then you can go here and you have to choose, uh, you have to pick the um, compromised user that you want to use there. Um, so now we can either choose, basically we can do this for all compromised users or just the selected user. Um, now, one thing to say is that this only picks up currently scheduled meetings, um, obviously. So uh, basically, we can run this throughout the day multiple times or, you know, at the start of the day, you could run it, see if any new meetings have been added um, and then kind of keep running it to, to pull back new information. So first of all, it dumps the standard dial-in information to the output log. So if you've ever had an email inviting you to a Skype meeting, uh, this will look fairly familiar to you. So you've got the internal number you can dial and then a number for each country or city within that country. Um, and so now apologies for how utterly rubbish this looks. Um, as I said, my training lab unfortunately kind of packing in at the key moment there. Um, but yeah, so to stress, this isn't an exploit or a zero day. It's basically highlighting what's already possible um, through kind of weaponization of the UCWA API uh, for attackers. Obviously, it does depend on compromised credentials, but basically so far this tool has shown um, how we can go from external over the internet to kind of complete compromise and to this point of being able to dump out um, well, yeah, scheduled meetings for compromised users. So one thing to say is that when uh, kind of using this tool on, on jobs, then often you find if you're going to get anyone, you probably are going to get like 50 to 100 users. Um, and obviously in that case, then this becomes more interesting because, you know, one user might have one meeting that week. But if you've got 50 users, then maybe you've got someone um, who's a little bit more interesting. So you can then see here um, what happens when you run this tool is that it gives you information for each meeting that, that compromised user has scheduled. Um, so the conference ID there is the PIN. So basically when you dial in, you dial in to the, to the phone number and it asks you for a PIN and that's that conference ID. Um, and basically that conference ID is unique to that user. So uh, when you dial in, you'll be impersonating whoever it is that you've uh, compromised. So, for example, this you dial in, you put in the pin, and then, then you show up as being, uh, say, Chris Nevin guest. Um, now, obviously, if the people in the meeting are kind of using the, um, the, the desktop application, then maybe it would look weird to have multiple Chris Nevin guests there. If everyone's using the phone to dial in, um, I'm not sure that they would notice this at all. At, at all. And in fact, even if they did see these two Chris Nevin guests, um, you know, how likely is it that people are going to assume, oh, this is someone impersonating and joining in and listening, um, as opposed to, you know, maybe there's some weird bug that's happening. So the information we get here includes the subject of the meeting um, and the attendees. So obviously these meetings here I've scheduled um, just to kind of demonstrate, uh, but obviously this could be a lot more juicy. So, for example, you've compromised a user, you know from their address book that they're the head of financial fraud and this meeting subject shows it's the weekly financial crime investigation update. Um, so obviously you can see why this would be kind of concerning for an organisation if this was possible um, because, again, without any exploit, any need for any further phishing or payloads being executed, you've basically gone from being uh, over the internet to being able to listen in on and even record uh, these sensitive meetings essentially impersonating that user. Um, so on the right you can see the lobby bypass enabled. That basically means that if you dial in 
does it bypass the lobby um, if that's enabled that means you're not even in a meet, uh, waiting room that someone has to let you in um, so the join URL um, if you go to that you can join the meeting and you can basically enter a name of your choice so obviously one thing you could do is again you've dumped the address book um, uh, you know is there a social engineering angle maybe you could kind of choose your name based on that um, potentially it might be more likely to get caught whereas actually just dialing in and there being two of the compromised user uh, is maybe less um, troubling so the another thing to say is that the API basically only seems to give the meeting expiry so that's two weeks after the meeting ends so carnivore will take off it will remove the two weeks for you automatically um, and then it's kind of maybe you'll need to do some um, kind of common sense around that so for example uh, you see the top meeting there all we actually have been able to pull is that the meeting ends at 11 30. now i've set the subject for that one to be the the time while i was troubleshooting so you can see that actually that meeting starts at 11. Um, as i say normally you wouldn't get that information because that's the subject so um, obviously yeah if you apply some um, common sense to it then you can see okay the meeting ends at 11 30 it probably starts at 11 um, or even 10 30. Um, so yeah so that's um, the meeting snooping what, what you get back from it basically so there are a couple of extra points to mention which are that the, this only uh, seems to be able to pull back self-scheduled meetings um, so again doesn't fully make sense to me because obviously in Outlook or something you don't just see the meetings you've scheduled you see every meeting uh, that you're scheduled to be a part of um, unfortunately we're not able to get that through this tool um, so yeah and then also uh, meeting end time only as I said before um, now there are some weird edge cases with that so for example I set a, a recurring meeting and so the only information we get back is that it ends on the 26th of December 2022 um, which obviously isn't that useful again maybe you could figure out okay that's a Friday it's a half um, so maybe it's every Friday um, but again uh, we can't get that back through the API unfortunately okay so office 365 um, so I'm not going to demo this um, so what I've been showing so far is basically just my lab um, and so yeah we're not, not going to demo office 365 but I'm going to talk you through um, how carnival works so for example um, or sorry one thing to say is that username enumeration uh, that doesn't require a password guess has been quite widely covered so there's things like 0365 or 0365 enum um, so i'm just going to quickly kind of get into password spraying um, and give some key pointers so as i've said before federated as a win um, so just the usual active directory rules will apply to lockouts um, but again that kind of doesn't include the um, extremely robust office 365 rules so um, as i've said there's a link that i'm about to show you where you can find out if a organization is federated or not um, if it is you'll get back the adfs server location um, and carnival will add that automatically so if it's not federated we can still uh, spray sorry we have to spray the office portal but then we can also determine uh, if a user is and password is valid even if we have mfa on there um, and sorry i should have said again with federated uh, if it's federated you have to spray adfs and you can't spray the office portal and um, you won't get back anything interesting uh, anything useful so password spray countermeasures for office 365 so they have things like a, tr a trusted versus untrusted network have separate bad password counts so again if you're from the untrusted side which presumably you would be um, from an untrusted network then you know your password spray is adding to account of everyone else in the world so again lockout is fairly uh, frequent and uh, quick um, but from the Microsoft side obviously that's designed so that then the genuine user can still sign in while on their corporate VPN or something like that. Um, so obviously good security uh, measures, but difficult from a, a red team perspective. So first of all, to find out if the organization is federated, 
So this is an example request here. So the username itself is irrelevant. Um, it's just the app domain.com that we're looking for. And the response here, so if they were federated, that would say uh, federated instead of managed. Um, and it can also include some uh, kind of boilerplate text. So for example, is keep me signed in disabled? Um, obviously that one might be interesting from a red team perspective because uh, maybe it hints that they have fairly good security and they've had uh, their configuration looked at because um, users can't just stay signed in forever. Um, you also get the Federation brand name there um, and you can get back, um, you know, logo information and that kind of thing. Um, so also if this said federated, then we would see the, the um, location of the ADFS um, authentication endpoint there as well. So for password spraying, um, this is how Carnivore does it. So this is the endpoint that we're hitting. Um, there's the username and the password. So the client ID and the scope, obviously that could be tweaked to maybe be a little bit more uh, realistic or representative, but um, this is what Carnivore uses. Um, so this first one is if there's an invalid password. Now, obviously, the, the actual response here says invalid username or password. So obviously, that seems like maybe that's going to be a bit tricky for us. Um, is it the username or is it the password? We're not fully sure. But then if the username is incorrect, then we get this message back. Uh, the user account does not exist uh, in that directory. So obviously, from that, we can tell that the previous response means the password's wrong, not the username. Um, and just to also mention there where it says email hidden, um, I've not added that. That's the actual response. So then this is a valid user and password without MFA. Um, so again, this is specific to the request that I make in Carnivore. Um, so because we gave a, a client ID that doesn't exist, then if, that, if the username and password is correct, you'd get this unauthorized client and a, a message that the, that application doesn't exist because um, obviously uh, it's not a proper client ID. Um, and again, so if it's valid user and password with MFA, um, then again, we get this invalid grant, uh, but now it's telling us that it's due to configuration, meaning that you need to supply multi-factor authentication. So again, username and password is correct, but you, you need MFA. So outro uh, very briefly. Yes, so almost forgot to put it in, but here's a link to the tool itself. Um, so obviously you can go there and download the latest version and uh, any issues or anything that you want to bring up there, um, I'll be happy to try and help wherever I can. So thank you for listening. Hopefully it's been useful and uh, enjoy carnivoring.